Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Wednesday, November 1st, 2023. All right, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today. Israel told the U.S. that mass civilian casualties would happen in the Gaza war. So during conversations with Israeli officials, it became clear to the Biden administration that Israel believed mass civilian casualties were an acceptable price of the bombing campaign in Gaza. And this was reported by the New York Times uh, late on Monday. So this report said that Israeli officials referred to the U.S. and allied bombing campaigns in Germany and Japan during World War II that killed hundreds of thousands of civilians. You know, we have seen Israeli officials say these things publicly as well. One official I could think of is the Israeli ambassador to the U.K. And this reference includes the U.S. bombings of Japanese cities, the fire bombings of Japanese cities, which in one night in Tokyo in 1945, it's estimated that somewhere around 100,000 civilians were killed in uh, U.S. fire bombing, burned to death. One of the most brutal ways uh, you could kill someone. And this also includes, you know, they're also referencing the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this is what they're talking about. And the reason I thought it was important to highlight this is because this shows that, the you know, the U.S. knows. And, and as we're seeing it play out in Gaza, these massive civilian casualties, and we see U.S. officials shrugging, shrugging it off claiming that they're trying to do something but you know it just goes to show that they knew they know what they're supporting and it hasn't stopped uh, that support so israel's plans for mass slaughter in gaza and the growing child death toll have not impacted u.s support this report this times report focused on how the biden administration is paying lip service to the idea of limiting civilian casualties but it also acknowledged that they're not telling Israel what to do. They're only asking questions. So if you look at the New York Times report, it's actually saying that, oh, the U.S. has changed its messaging on Gaza. They're saying that they want a limit to civilian casualties, but it also says that they're not actually telling Israel to do anything. And right now, according to Gaza's health ministry, the death toll in Gaza has surpassed 8,500 Palestinians, which includes over 3,500 children. Now, in light of this death toll, the Pentagon was asked if the U.S. would put limits on the weapons that it gives Israel. And Pentagon spokeswoman Sabrina Singh said no. So when she was asked again, it's important that she was asked if the U.S., because of the, the huge civilian casualties, the child casualties, is the U.S. putting any sort of restrictions on the weapons that they're sending to Israel? And she said, quote, we are not putting any limits on how Israel uses weapons that is provided. That is really up to the Israeli Defense Force to use in how they are going to conduct their operations, but we're not putting any constraints on that, end quote. So on one hand, you have the State Department, Biden saying, oh, we care about civilian casualties, but the Pentagon, you know, clearly that doesn't translate to anything. And the next one here, at least 50 killed by Israeli strikes on the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza. So, you know, this just goes to show uh, that a lot of civilians are being still being killed, you know, despite all these things. And that that New York Times report saying that the U.S. is expressing caution about civilian casualties. Israeli warplanes on Tuesday hammered the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza City with airstrikes, killing at least 50 people. Um, I know it's in North Gaza. I'm not sure, actually, if it's right in Gaza City. Um, I meant to change that in this story. But the Israeli military has acknowledged that it launched the airstrikes, claiming a senior Hamas commander was in the civilian populated camp. So they're saying one Hamas commander was there and they leveled this place. And for their part, Hamas is denying that one of its commanders was in the camp. So Gaza's interior ministry said that the strikes were launched with U.S. made bombs. They didn't specify which ones. 
Um, and it's not clear if they have uh, remains of a U.S. bomber or not. But uh, the Interior Ministry spokesman said, quote, These buildings house hundreds of citizens. The Occupation's Air Force destroyed this district with six U.S.-made bombs. It is the latest massacre caused by Israeli aggression on the Gaza Strip, end quote. So Gaza's Indonesian hospital, which is nearby, confirmed that more than 50 people were killed in the strike. 50 bodies were brought to the hospital. Um, Gaza's health ministry has said at least 100 were killed. And the interior ministry is saying that the total casualties were around 400, which includes both dead and wounded. So there's not um, a final number on the death toll. But photos of the aftermath show craters and rubble from destroyed and damaged buildings. Oh, that link didn't work. I got to find another link for the pictures. Um, so, you know, all this stuff is, you know, really wearing on Israel's public image when they see strikes like this. And there's actually this clip going around of Wolf Blitzer, who's a host of CNN, and a lot of people have pointed out on Twitter, which I didn't realize, that he actually used to work for APAC, the uh, you know Israel lobby in the U.S., and he was asking an Israeli military spokesman if Israel was aware that the refugee camp was full of innocent civilians, men, women, and children, innocent people, and the spokesman replied, quote, this is the tragedy of war, Wolf. We've been saying for days, move south, end quote. So not denying that they were civilians there, just saying there was a Hamas commander, so we had to level the place, and that's that. And you could tell Blitzer was kind of, you know, uh, just it's just interesting to see people that have been so staunchly pro-Israel um, reacting in the way that he did. So many of the Palestinians who fled North Gaza, because you have this spokesman saying, we told them to leave, but many of the ones that did leave uh, found no safety in the South. Uh, there's airstrikes still going on in the South, and uh, some of them have actually returned to the North because they said it would be better to die in their homes than to sleep out on the street or wherever they could find shelter in the South and still have to worry about getting killed by airstrikes. Um, I would say now the North with the ground invasion is certain, probably more um, dangerous than the South. But if you don't have a home in the South and there's not anywhere for you to really take refuge, you know, it's really tough, tough to say. Um, all right. So the next one here, a detailed satellite view of Israel's invasion. So this is more of a visual story. This is from the New York Times and I was kind of struggling to figure out what to write about the ground fighting that's been going on. Um, as far as I know, you know, it's it's not really clear exactly how heavy everything is. And the uh, I know the Israeli military said on Tuesday that two of their soldiers died fighting on the ground. Hamas said that they destroyed over 20 Israeli armored vehicles or something. They're saying that Israeli death toll mu must be higher. Um, Israel's not saying how many Hamas guys they killed, um, but these satellite images do show uh, that it is, you know, a significant push that's going on here from Israel's military in the north. Uh, and, and again, this is more just visual for people watching the video, but it shows the tracks of the tanks moving in on kind of the outskirts of Gaza, which there's a lot of farmland up there. And then... Um, where they're pushing in more and you know it's a decent amount of tanks and armored vehicles that are in there and pushing towards gaza city um so it does seem like there is heavy fighting going on on the ground but the extent we don't really know israel's being kind of vague about it um all right so the next one here we just have the live updates from middle east eye on the situation in gaza and this says, so at, they're saying at least 400 Palestinians have been killed or wounded. So again, 400 total casualties in the Jabalia airstrikes. Um, so a few live updates here. Israel arrests scores in pre-dawn raid on Janine refugee camp. So that's over in the West Bank. Uh, Biden says no forced displacement in call with Jordan's King Abdullah. Uh, Chile recalls the ambassador to Israel. Blinken emphasizes, sorry, Blinken emphasizes minimizing civilian casualties in call with Israeli president. Um, 
So apparently he talked to Herzog, the Israeli president, and said to minimize civilian casualties. But again, they're saying this stuff publicly. They're putting this stuff out. But what are they actually doing about it? It doesn't seem like anything. They're still completely supporting this, and they want another $14 billion to give to Israel. Um, so again, I think the public, you know, Israel seems to be losing the PR campaign uh, quite a bit here. Um you know, and more so than usual. And probably one reason is because this is, you know, the biggest Gaza war that we've seen. Um, and everybody, you know, you have these journalists in Gaza on the ground. If you follow them on, uh, a lot of them are on Instagram. You, you just see them going from rubble, you know, airstrike site to airstrike site. And a lot, you see just all the destruction and the dead people, the dead children. It's really brutal stuff that people, millions of people can just go look at. Uh, all right, next one here. Yemen's Houthis launch missiles and drones at Israel. So a military spokesman for Yemen's Houthis, uh, who govern most of North Yemen, said Tuesday that they launched missiles and drones at Israel and warned the attacks would continue until Israel ends its war in Gaza. So Israel said that it activated its Arrow air defense system for the first time during its Gaza war to intercept a missile fired from the Red Sea. Israeli fighter jets also downed two hostile targets flying over the Red Sea that were believed to be drones. The Israeli military said they were intercepted and that there was no intrusion into Israeli territory. So Houthi military spokesman Yahya Sari, he said the operation was the third targeting Israel and warned that more attacks would come until the Israeli aggression stops. So he's saying it's the third time they launched uh, missiles or drones at Israel. We know earlier this month, the Pentagon said that they intercepted, that a U.S. warship in the Red Sea intercepted missiles and drones fired by the Houthis. I didn't see the Houthis claim the attack at the time, but this appears to be confirmation. And these Houthi attacks and threats to launch more attacks are another sign that Israel's war in Gaza could explode into a major regional conflict. The U.S. has deployed an enormous amount of firepower to the region in the name of deterring other actors from entering the war. And this raises questions about a potential U.S. response to the Houthi attacks. Is that something that could happen? I think that's a legitimate question. I saw reports that the, that Israel was considering ways to respond to this, but I think it's certainly possible that the U.S. could get involved. The U.S. has been basically at war with the Houthis since 2015. They've been backing the Saudi-UAE coalition in Yemen since then in this brutal war that has killed hundreds of thousands of people, including lots of children who've starved to death or died of disease caused by the conditions of the war and the blockade that was imposed by the Saudis. Um, and... The Houthis are Shia, they are Zaidi Shia, a different sect of Shia Islam than, than what's practiced by the uh, leaders of Iran, uh, but they are aligned with Iran politically, um, despite the things that the U.S. says that, you know, a lot of media outlets just say kind of as a fact. We don't really know how much Iran supports the Houthis um, when it comes to material support, missiles, drones. The Houthis have um, some pretty sophisticated long-range missiles that are similar to the ones that Iran has. Um, I know some people believe that they might produce them by themselves with blueprints that they receive from Iran. Iran denies that they arm the Houthis, and the Houthis also deny that Iran arms them. And there has been a blockade on Yemen, so you know, we just don't really know. Um, and you know, another question is if you know th this is going to be portrayed as an Iranian proxy attacking Israel. Um, but we don't know if, if Iran directed these attacks or if the Houthis are acting on their own. Um, so you always have to keep that stuff in mind. But certainly this is a risk of regional escalation. And it'll put the Saudis in a very awkward position here because uh, one important point is that while the Saudis have been fighting this war against the Houthis since 2015, a ceasefire since April 2022 uh, has held pretty well. Uh, there haven't been any Saudi airstrikes in Yemen since then or Houthi attacks on Saudi Arabia with the missiles and drones. There's been some fighting on the ground, but for the most part, it's held and they've actually held held talks, the Saudis and the Houthis. Um, so they are, uh, you know, that war has, has not been very hot for the past year. Um, but still, I think it's an awkward position for the Houthis. What if the U.S. or Israel starts 
attacking Yemen. Um, you know, who knows what could happen then. Uh, all right. So the next one here, U.S. Special Operations Forces are in Israel helping locate hostages. So American Special Operations Forces are on the ground in Israel helping locate hostages Hamas brought into Gaza after the October 7th attack on southern Israel. And a Pentagon official said this on Tuesday. This is Christopher P. Mayer. He's the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations. He said, quote, we're actively helping the Israelis to do a number of things, identify hostages, including American hostages, end quote. Mayor did not say how many U.S. commandos were in Israel, but U.S. officials told the New York Times that several dozen had been deployed in addition to a small team that was already in Israel on October 7th. Shortly after the Hamas attack, the Pentagon offered Israel special operations support. So the, these reports say that the, the U.S. commandos are not assigned to combat roles. And so far, there's no indication that, they're, that U.S. troops are on the ground in Gaza as Israeli forces are pushing further in. Um, Mayer said the special operators were talking through with their Israeli counterparts, um, you know, what's going to happen during the fighting in Gaza. And this deployment, again, demonstrates just how deeply involved the U.S. is in Israel's onslaught in Gaza. And this U.S. support uh, has provoked these attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria, which did continue. There's more reports of them on Tuesday. Um, you know, they continue to, to be attacked, the U.S. troops based in those countries. All right. So the next one here, U.S. and Israel consider deploying a multinational force to Gaza after the war. So Bloomberg reported on Tuesday that the U.S. and Israel are considering establishing a multinational force to occupy the Gaza Strip if Israel successfully eliminates Hamas. So the idea would be to grant temporary oversight of Gaza to countries in the region backed by a force with troops from the U.S., Britain, France, and Germany. So that's a Western military force in Gaza. That does not sound like a good idea. Sources told Bloomberg that ideally the force would also include Arab nations, such as Saudi Arabia and the UAE. The report said President Biden was aware deploying U.S. troops to Gaza would carry huge political risks, and it said the discussions were still at an early stage. The Palestinians would almost certainly resist the idea of a Western force occupying Gaza. I mean, I just can't imagine a situation where they agree to that, uh, but that might not matter. So the, this idea is one of three options being considered for a potential post-war Gaza, although Israeli officials have said the current conflict could last years. The second option includes establishing a peacekeeping force similar to the multinational force and observers, the MFO, which is a group that operates in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula to enforce the Egypt-Israel peace treaty to observe the area. And the other option would grant temporary control of Gaza to the UN so under a UN umbrella. So Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Tuesday acknowledged that the U.S. was considering what would become of Gaza if Israel defeats Hamas. And that's a big if this is going to be very difficult for Israel, and the Israeli officials are saying that uh, it could take years to, you know, this war could go on for years. And we also know that based on that leaked document from Israel's intelligence ministry, which is no surprise that there, the government of Netanyahu is considering they what they would really want to do is push all the Palestinians out of Gaza. Um, and we'll get more into that in the next one here. Uh, so this next story, Netanyahu lobbied the EU to pressure Egypt on Gaza refugees. So Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu lobbied EU leaders to pressure Egypt into allowing Palestinian refugees into its territory from Gaza. And this was reported by the Financial Times on Monday. So this report said that the discussions happened last week, but key European countries, including Britain, France, and Germany, dismiss the idea as unrealistic due to Egypt's opposition to absorbing Palestinian refugees. Uh, Sisi, the Egyptian president, said recently that he opposed any attempt to liquidate the Palestinian issue 
uh, or force the displacement of Palestinians from Gaza, you know, anywhere is basically what he's saying, and especially not into Egypt. So the Financial Times report came after this document was leaked. Um, and after that leak, Egypt reiterated its opposition to the idea of Israel pushing the Palestinians into Egypt. Uh, Egypt's prime minister said, quote, we, the Egyptians, are ready to sacrifice millions of lives so that nobody approaches a grain of sand in North Sinai, end quote. So very vehemently opposed um, to this idea. All right. So the next one here, Blinken says that the U.S. must fund Ukraine and Israel uh, because of China. So he's tying it all together, connecting all the dots. Biden administration officials are arguing that the U.S. needs to fund the wars in Ukraine and Gaza to send a message to China in their pitch for Congress to authorize a massive $105 billion spending package that includes military aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said at a Senate Appropriations Committee hearing on Tuesday, quote, what happens in Ukraine, what happens in the Middle East, also matters for the Indo-Pacific. Beyond Europe, we know that our allies as well as our adver- adversaries, as well as our competitors are watching that conflict. They're watching our response. So this funding request is vital to secure a free and open Indo-Pacific in the face of mounting challenges in that region, end quote. So Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin made the same argument at the hearing. He said, quote, China would like to see the United States be unsuccessful. They would like to see Russia continue to challenge us and keep us focused on that area so we have less time, energy, and resources, end quote. So it's kind of strange because he's saying that China would like the U.S. to keep spending on the war in Ukraine in in an argument to say, give us more money to spend on the war in Ukraine. It's it's strange. And not that I agree with them, but I know there are some China hawks who argue that the U.S. should be more focused on, you know, Taiwan. So they should scale back what they're doing in Ukraine to focus on that, um, which makes more sense than trying to do it all. Um, I don't think the U.S. should do any of this, of course, but you know, if you're going to be strategic about it, I feel like there's just a much smarter way to go about everything. But this seems more like imperial hubris from the Biden administration trying to fund all these conflicts. So the $105 billion request that was made by the White House includes $7.4 billion to advance the administration's strategy against China in the Asia Pacific. It includes over $3 billion to finance submarine construction, That's part of the AUKUS military pact between the U.S., Australia, and Britain. Uh, It includes $2 billion in assistance for regional countries and $2 billion in military aid. And it's not clear if that entire $2 billion is for Taiwan or potentially other countries in the region. Um, So the next one here, the uh, Blinken got, uh, was disrupted at that Senate hearing by protesters opposing what the Biden administration is supporting in Gaza. So this, this article is from Middle East Eye. A group of protesters repeatedly interrupted a U.S. Senate hearing on Tuesday where U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin were speaking about a $106 billion budget request of which $14 billion would go to Israel amid its bombing campaign and ground invasion of Gaza. Numerous protesters repeatedly yelled, ceasefire now, with their hands covered in red paint, a reference that the Biden administration had blood on its hands over Israel's killing of Palestinian civilians. One at a time, the activists waited for Blinken to begin his testimony before shouting over him. So it was several disruptions throughout the um, the uh, the hearing, and I know some of the at least some of the activists were from the anti-war group Code Pink. Medea Benjamin uh, said she was arrested. She's a co-founder of Code Pink that most people know. Um, so good to see people doing things like this in uh, these hearings. All right. So the next one here, NATO chief says the Gaza war cannot interfere with Ukraine. So this article is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. 
The civilian leader of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization condemned the Hamas attack on Israel, but emphasized that support for Tel Aviv must not encroach on aid for Ukraine. Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg went on to warn Iran and Hezbollah against attacking Israel as Tel Aviv relentlessly bombs Gaza. So speaking at the Nordic Council in Oslo, Stoltenberg expressed that military support was the only way to achieve peace. And this is something you repeatedly hear him say is that we need weapons for peace. He said, quote, a new winter is approaching and we must expect new attacks against energy supplies and other critical infrastructure. There are no signs that Russia is planning for peace. On the contrary, they are planning for more war. Therefore, me, what we must continue to support Ukraine. That means more weapons. And I say that because I want peace in Ukraine, end quote. Uh, sure. And the quote that he said about Gaza was that the war, quote, must not lead to a weakening of our will and ability to support Ukraine, end quote. Um, and that is everything for the news for today. Go check out our viewpoints. We have one from Ted Snyder. Three major events in Russia the world did not notice. One from Sheldon Richmond, Don't Police the World. One from Jonathan Cook, Israel's long-held plan to drive Gaza's people into Sinai is now within reach. One from Brad Pierce, Peace with China is the only way to protect Taiwan. And one from Eli Clifton, Wall Street eyes big profits from Israel-Hamas war. Um, so that is everything for me for today. Uh, you could always help us out by sharing the show. Um, I want to remind you guys that Friday I will be on TimCast on Friday night, which they start streaming at 8 p.m. Eastern. It's about a two-hour show, um, so hopefully I could talk some foreign policy stuff on there. Uh, so check that out. And, uh, yeah, that's really it. I will be back tomorrow with some more news for you. Thanks for listening.